Back in 1964, Malcolm Douglas left Melbourne to travel Australia. A six-month journey became a four-year saga, during which he produced one of Australia's most successful documentary films, Across the Top. In that film, he travelled deep into little-known Arnhem Land and lived with the swamp people, Aborigines who still preferred their tribal way of life. He spent long periods in the bush learning the old way. He observed their strange hunting and survival techniques and accepted whatever food was available. He learned to understand and appreciate Aboriginal customs. He was given a tribal name and taught the significance of traditional ceremonies. Now, 17 years later, with mixed feelings of excitement and apprehension, he's returning to revisit his Aboriginal friends. 30 kilometres south of Darwin is the turn-off to the recently completed highway that runs all the way to the Arnhem Land border. Malcolm's heading for the remote Arafura swamps in central Arnhem Land. Access is difficult. Permits must be pre-arranged with the local Aboriginal tribes. The tremendous rush to develop the north is soon obvious. The Arnhem Highway passes the mining township of Jabaru, being constructed to service the vast uranium deposits nearby. Immediately past Jabaru, the bitumen ends abruptly, and for the first time since leaving Darwin, Malcolm feels he's back in the bush. As the tide drops on the East Alligator River, the crossing is made into the Arnhem Land Reserve. From this point on, entry permits must be produced. This remote region is famous for its spectacular wildlife. A frilled lizard is alarmed at their intrusion. The land cruiser easily traverses the wide coastal plains through the herds of introduced Asian buffalo, now so much a part of the Northern Territory. An old man goanna plods methodically along. He's certainly not afraid of intruders. In fact, these reptiles can be very aggressive and inflict a nasty wound with their long claws and sharp teeth. Now that was just a little too close. Malcolm has some great photographs, so he leaves the goanna well alone. The flat coastal plains end abruptly at the spectacular Arnhem Land escarpment. From here on, the road deteriorates to a track, winding across country to the scattered Aboriginal communities. With the dry season almost over, the daily temperatures soar above 40 degrees Celsius. Brett Nixon's come across from the Kimberley to accompany Malcolm, and they take a break in one of the many permanent rivers. Now it's on to Garmadi, a small settlement where the people prefer to live away from the main communities along the coast. Malcolm's pleased to meet an old friend, Bullen Bullen. Only a teenager when they last met, he's now a respected authority on tribal law. He notifies everyone that the two white men are in the area. Malcolm's amazed at the great changes taking place. Most obvious are the Toyotas and radios for communication. Until recently, messages often took weeks to reach each group. Now the two-way radios are in constant use and the movements of all vehicles can be closely monitored. Formalities over, they press on, and bush directions are a great help when they know that you're coming. Finally, the men reach Morgram, a bush camp on the edge of the Arafura swamp. 
Malcolm's warmly welcomed by Munborara, a dominant tribal elder he first met in 1965. Fortunately, Malcolm's aware from his previous contact that the display of fighting spears is all part of the welcome. The protocol established, pamphlets and a book that Malcolm wrote about his earlier visit create immediate interest. Through the afternoon, he's patiently acquainted with all the social issues. Who has died? What ceremonies are being performed? Who's getting married? If anyone has been speared recently and why? All the tribal matters that he must understand immediately if his visit is to be successful. Many of the younger ones don't even remember Malcolm. Photos of deceased relatives and of ceremonies are a special concern. Only certain family members are allowed to view them. Napapu waits patiently until it's decided that she can look at a photograph of her deceased husband, who was a good friend of Malcolm's. The elders are encouraging the re-establishment of these bush camps on tribal lands. It reinforces tribal tradition, ceremonies and law. Everyone is much happier, especially the children. In fact, there's been quite a population explosion of fine, healthy youngsters. The older ones are after yabbies, a popular pastime everywhere. The younger ones are just having fun. Brett and Malcolm are soon accepted, and the older boys are keen to show them their chosen haunts. The stems of these giant lilies are as sweet as sugar cane. The intense heat and humidity are enervating, but an instant sun hat saves the situation. Malcolm has eaten these seeds in Papua New Guinea. They're sweet and nourishing, tasting like peas. A minor irritation. Blood-sucking leeches. The Aborigines loathe them. During the filming of Across the Top, Malcolm learned many survival skills from Mill Peru, and it's not long before they're together again, out looking for bush tucker. There's a treat in the trunk of this tree, a native bee's nest. Mill Peru is unconcerned that he's killing a tree. He wants the honey to feed his family. The small native bee is often mistaken for a bush fly. It's unable to sting, so collecting the honey is a simple task. Any honey that runs from the wax is sopped up with wads of grass. Overnight, the honey will drip to the bottom of the container. 
In the morning, a delicious treat is ready for the children. Since Europeans arrived in Australia, Aboriginal traditions have almost vanished. Today in Arnhem Land, age-old skills are practiced still. Mill Peru shows Malcolm and the young boys how to construct a bark canoe. The bark must be moist so that it can be prized free without splitting. This method is also used for gathering sheets of bark for shelters. Boys anywhere are always hungry, and when the job's finished, it's time for a feed on the inner leaves of one of the many edible palms. A soaking over several days softens the bark for shaping. With the application of water and heat, the bark bends easily to the required shape, ready to be stitched with bush twine. This looks deceptively simple, but it takes considerable knowledge and skill to complete a canoe without splitting the bark. The cooling and bending must be done just at the right moment. It's still very hot, so wads of grass protect Milperu's legs from burns. Within the hour, the canoe is ready. Any small leaks are stopped with mud. These craft are used extensively in the swamps, especially during the wet season, to negotiate the flooded plains when collecting swamp birds' eggs.
Bullen Bullen has arrived from Garmadi, and with the swamp so low, he's after file snakes, a favoured food. The heavy, muscular reptile dies instantly as the spine snaps. Although not poisonous, they can inflict a severe bite if handled carelessly. The pointed ends of these simple craft are ideal for slicing through reeds and water hyacinth. Another much sought after food is the tortoise, collected in large numbers during the dry season and kept alive for weeks. These specimens were dug from the ground where they were hibernating. The traditional dugout canoe is used in deeper water, and Milperu's always happy to have Malcolm along to do the paddling. With his uncanny accuracy, Milperu spears fish and tortoise among the reeds. And even the occasional file snake is impaled. The aluminium paddle, a modern addition, belongs to Malcolm. Natural plantations of cycad palms grow throughout Arnhem Land. Before the introduction of European foods, the cycad nut was a major source of carbohydrate. Recently, with the emphasis on retaining tribal ways, the women are once again collecting the cycads. Only those nuts with the outside skin breaking away from the kernel are selected. Dexterous toes are most useful, especially when hands are occupied holding babies and dilly bags. Only the kernel is edible. The children, so contented in their bush environment, are eager to learn. At this stage in the preparation, the nuts must not be eaten. They're extremely poisonous, causing violent nausea. The kernels are immersed in water for several days to dissipate the poison, and then they're ready for the next process. Methodically, they're ground into a paste and wrapped in paper bark ready for cooking. Mm -hmm. 
The women rest in the shade at midday until the loaves are cooked. The cyced nut loaf has always been a valuable food. It keeps for weeks in its paper bark wrap. <laughs> With Malcolm's new vehicle available, some of the families are keen to visit a tribal area further south. After days spent deciding who will actually go, they're on their way. The river, still under tidal influence, must be crossed at the dropping tide, and only at this ford is there a rock bottom. A good winch enables them to tackle many a difficult crossing with ease. <laughs> Brett has spotted a school of jumping mullet. They head out across the Arafura swamps, through the giant ant hills, to the stony country and beyond, into a wilderness that even the Aborigines have left. There are no roads. Only the memories of one old man. For years, he's talked of a river that runs always, fresh and full, even to the end of the dry season. After a tiring day's drive in severe heat, old Wagir, their guide, points out a most welcome sight, the swift-running Goida River. Wagir left this place after a tribal massacre, and today he's the only man left who can rightfully claim the country. Everyone's amazed to see such a flow of water at the end of the dry. Wagir says that it runs out of the earth in the stony country even further inland. As it's so isolated, the fishing must be good, and Malcolm's off looking for a likely spot. The tunnel of trees makes welcome shade after the fierce heat of the open plain. The still, deep water below the rapids looks perfect. Immediately the fish are biting. Malcolm hooks one, but it snags the line on the bottom. A few jabs with a spear and Malcolm retrieves his catch. A fighting Saratoga. In the days to follow, Saratoga are so plentiful that they become the staple food for the camp. After removal of the stubborn scales, the fish are laid on a bed of leaves on the hot coals. The paper bark and sand covering retains heat and moisture during cooking. While waiting for the meal, Brett and the children revel in the cool water. Brett is a ferocious, man-eating crocodile. And the children yell in delighted terror. Not a grain of sand taints the fish. Paper bark, the aluminium foil of the bush, is free and readily available, only as far away as the nearest melaleuca tree.
Brett accidentally brushes a green ant's nest. Living in the trees, they fix leaves together with a viscous body fluid to secure their nests. And if the nests are disturbed, the ants defend their homes ferociously. Individuals will die rather than release a hold on an intruder. Although the days run bearably hot, the nights and early mornings are refreshingly cool. There's always a good morning greeting for Malcolm from Jowdy, his Kelpie. Then it's a chat with old Wagir to discuss plans for the days ahead. Today, he says, they must return to Morgram. The weather is building up to rain, and they could be caught here if they delay longer. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, they're pushing back over the scorching plains. Brolgers, blurred reflections in the shimmering heat mirage, are startled by the approach of the labouring vehicle. The rising heat spirals into willy-willies, a sweeping menace as they build and dissipate over the plains. The whistling hawks enjoy the heat, swooping on the thermals. Wagir was right. Within minutes of arriving back at Morgram, the first wet season storm erupts violently over the camp. A prelude to the rainy season, these storms will in the coming weeks be more ominously frequent. By sundown, it's all over, and for the present, peace returns. Within weeks, this country will be under metres of water. But now the drying swamps attract myriads of water birds. To film them, Malcolm moves into a hide with his powerful telephoto lens. The pied stilts are the first to approach. By mid-morning, the gregarious pied geese are busily upending for food. Commonly called magpie geese, they once ranged all over Australia. Now they're found only in the north. The burdekin duck is another species decimated by European development.
Now a sight worth the long wait in the cramped, damp conditions. The majestic pelicans fishing. Working in formation, their beaks open like scoop nets below the surface. It often takes the pelican some time to manoeuvre the squirming, spiky fish head first for swallowing. As each bird has its fill, it goes to rest for the remainder of the day. Where the swamps have dried completely, thousands of brolgers converge to feed on the lily bulbs. These bulbs are also a reliable supply of food for the Aborigines at this time of year. Special dilly bags are woven. Then it's hard work in the sun digging for the bulbs. These small, peanut-like roots are the ones that the brolgers too are grubbing out. This boy, concerned about the intense heat, thoughtfully shades his baby brother. Paperbark containers are fashioned for water and the bulbs washed. The dilly bag sieves out the dirt, the V-shaped opening allowing access for the hands. When everyone has their fill, the remainder are wrapped and taken back to the camp for the men. As the boys grow older, they spend less time with the women, preferring to wander in small groups, practicing and developing their hunting and food gathering skills. These giant lily bulbs provide plenty of nourishment. Catching small fish is a favourite pastime too. The fish, hiding among the hyacinth roots, are trapped in the bottom of the canoe. When the game's over, the fish are either thrown back or used for bait. These children are fortunate. Leading a happy, carefree life within the bounds of strict tribal law, they belong to clans that own land and all the songs and dances and totems and paintings connected to the land. The elders, aware of the changes taking place, stress the importance of retaining the tribal values that maintain the links with their ancestral territories. The clan's beliefs are continually depicted on bark, the finished paintings explain all natural phenomena. Through the designs, the Aborigines understand clan relationships with the present world and the dream time, when everything was created by ancestral spirits.
To the Aborigines, these stories explain the real issues of life and, most important of all, what will happen to their spirits when they die. A number of the artists are famous, their paintings hanging in galleries throughout the world. This fame means little to them. One man who's rapidly becoming one of Arnhem Land's best painters is Bullen Bullen. Still relatively young, he believes strongly in retaining the close ties with his land. Today, he begins a painting for a Sydney exhibition. The sandpaper, purchased from the store on the coast, adds a modern touch to the age-old practice. The colours are always the same, red and yellow ochre, white clay and black charcoal. Through these paintings, Bullen Bullen strengthens his bond with his country. He symbolises the land, the sacred waterhole, and the totemic plants and animals. The sacred waterhole is of special importance, for the clan believes that their spirits come from this waterhole and will return to it when they die. The waterhole is shown here in the centre of the bark. Plants and animals associated with the waterhole, such as the magpie geese, long-necked tortoise, and water lilies, are totems, a visible link with both the land and their spiritual world. The cross hatching represents the country created by mythical spirits during the dream time. If the land is destroyed, it has a devastating effect on the members of the clan. Bullen Bullen's tribally important pictographs are also prized by art collectors. He makes periodic promotional trips to exhibitions at city galleries. He endures these experiences to raise sufficient money to run his Toyota and to purchase trade goods. Back at Garmadi, everyone's busy. Bullen Bullen is to become custodian of an important ritual. Large shelters are constructed for the anticipated visitors. Malcolm has been honoured with an invitation to stay and witness the important events. His Toyota is put to good use when Jipparoo appears with his trusty radio. A quick wiring job and he's advising everybody when they should arrive. Spears are prepared to be handed out as gifts to the participants of the ceremony. A brush is usually a stick chewed into shape. Bullen Bullen checks for balance and workmanship. They must be of high quality for such occasions. These spears are metal tipped for fighting and hunting game. Didgeridoos are tuned and repaired. Any cracks are filled with wild honeybees wax. Finally, the great day arrives. Over 200 people have gathered and the dancing begins. Bullen Bullen is heir to the Barambidi or Morning Star ceremony, which has been held in trust by relatives until his age and knowledge of tribal law could permit him to rightfully assume full responsibility and ownership. This ceremony is normally performed after a death to ensure the safe passage of the dead person's spirit to the totemic well. The correct song and dance sequences are shown to Bullen Bullen and his associated family. The ritual continues all through the night. And in the morning, the gifts, spears, blankets, axes and lengths of material are displayed. In a rousing finale, the ceremonial totem is brought forward for presentation. The decorated pole represents Barambidi, the
the morning star that actually guides dead clansmen's spirits to their eternal resting place. Clan totems associated with the morning star are presented through the dance. The ceremony ends with the spectacular Brolga dance. A sign of the times, a recorder is used to tape the age-old song cycles. The ritual, entrusted to Bullen Bullen, protocol is concluded with the presentation of the gifts. The Toyota leaving, laden with passengers, the two-way radios and tape recorders, all epitomise the rapid changes taking place in Arnhem Land. It's to be hoped that the traditional values will continue for many generations, for without their culture, the people are lost. Bullen Bullen, drained of all emotional energy, goes hunting alone, arranging to meet Malcolm and Brett later in the Ant Hill country, when he'll have time to talk and food to offer. These tombstone shapes are the homes of the magnetic termites. They build in a north-south direction to regulate the heat one side is always in the shade. Bullen Bullen, a superb hunter, arrives with a kangaroo and he and Malcolm collect ant bed for fire. The heat retained in the ant bed will cook the meat. The roux is gutted, stitched and its fur singed. The carcass is laid on a bed of leaves and covered with paper bark and sand. At the end of the day, it's ready. Cooked in this way, it's always tender, and Malcolm enjoys his portion. Another favoured meat is the aquatic file snake. Agile swimmers, they are lethargic and helpless out of water. They're hunted vigorously when the swamps are low. The men push through the matted reeds, grabbing the fleeing reptiles. Killed instantly, they're thrown to the women for collection. In the dark and murky world beneath the hyacinth, the snakes must be grabbed quickly and killed before they can bite. Every one of these snakes and tortoises will be eaten. The great number caught assures that there will be plenty for all the families. With dangerous crocodiles inhabiting the swamps, only large groups of people dare hunt the snakes. The general commotion panics the crocs. When Malcolm is so totally involved with his Aboriginal friends, he finds it easy to understand a little more of their customs and philosophies. The children, after a frolic in the water, romp through a nearby burnt-out thicket.
Malcolm and Brett have been with their Aboriginal friends for over two months, and now they must leave before the wet season makes a trek to Darwin impassable. The last minute farewells take all day. After so many years away from this country, Malcolm had been apprehensive of what he might find on his return. Some of his good friends had died since the making of Across the Top, and he had heard that there were rapid social changes taking place. So far, the people are coping well, with self-assurance and an awareness of the importance of their newly acquired rights. Malcolm hopes now that the future will find the Aborigines of Arnhem Land as happy and contented as they are today.